Hi there, Paul here. Thank you for watching another of my videos. Uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about why we shouldn't use Power Apps. Okay, a little bit controversial. Let's rephrase that. When should we not use Power Apps? So there are some use cases where Power Apps are a really good fit and some use cases where they're really not. And in the enthusiast community, we're often because um, we're excited by Power Apps and, and we're trying to push the limits of Power Apps, we're often seeing what we could do with it and not thinking enough about what we should do with it. So in this video, I'm going to go through what I perceive uh, in my experience to be the limitations of Power Apps and the times when you shouldn't be using it. I'm not saying that it's impossible to use for the scenarios or use cases I'm going to run through um, but I am saying in my view and my experience that you shouldn't be using it in those cases. Okay so let's jump in. Um, just a little proviso. I'm talking here about Canvas apps. Uh, I just work with Canvas apps. I don't work with model driven apps or Power Apps portals so I'm not covering those here. Everything I talk about here is in relation to Canvas Power Apps. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to um, present these limitations uh, as two sides of a coin. So in many cases, these limitations arise from the fact uh, that Power Apps tries to address a particular problem and perhaps addresses it very well. Um, but there's a flip side, uh, a limitation to it. You'll, you'll see what I mean as I go along. OK, so. The first thing I want to have a little look at then is distributing your apps. So distributing your apps is a real strength of Power Apps. You don't have to worry about complicated authentication and setting up web services and all sorts of other things. Um, sharing a Power App, uh, having created your app, is simply a case of, let's open one up here, simply a case of going into the file settings of your app. So let's come back a step here. So here we are, I've got an app here, a uh, spelling test, something I've been working on with my daughter. And when I want to share it, I've just got to come into the file, do the whole thing. So there's our usual view of Studio. So I come into file, um, make sure that I've saved and published the version that I want to share with people, but that's only a couple of clicks and hit on the share button and then Power Apps is going to give me uh, a list of people who I can share it with. So let's just wait for that to appear for a second. So I can see the people it's already shared with and then I can select other people simply by starting to type their email address into that list. Uh, and that's their Office 365 email address and so there's your limitation, okay? So it's super easy to share with people who are in your organization, but you can't share it with people outside of your organization. So if you wanted an app that your business partners would also make use of, or that your customers could make use of, then Power Apps is, I would argue, not the platform that you should be using. So let's um, see if we can make a note of these as we go along. So if your app needs some sort of external sharing, then Power Apps, not the solution. Okay, let's have a look at something else then. So another strong point of Power Apps, so forgive me, I'm gonna start drawing here. I'm not a great artist, as you may know. Um, but another strong area of Power Apps is the ability to create an app that will run across different platforms and form factors. So we can create apps or an app that runs on Android devices and it runs on iOS devices and it can also run in a web browser. I think pretty much any modern web browser will will run Power Apps. So that's really awesome if you if you do need something which is is sort of cross platform and even cross form factor like that because we can develop apps that are running portrait, um, you know, so this way up or in landscape. Um, and although it is quite a lot of work, we can create 
responsive apps that will flip according to the dimensions of the window in which you're viewing them. So that's not to be underestimated. That's some really awesome stuff there. The drawback is that you're always working, or one drawback, there's a couple. The first drawback is that you're always working, if you like, to the lowest common denominator. If a feature is not available across those all of those platforms, then you know it's likely not implemented. So let's imagine that you are going to be creating an app and you know that the vast majority of the users of that app, or perhaps all of the users of that app, are going to be using it on a Windows machine, either a laptop or a desktop. They're going to be using it with a keyboard and a mouse in front of them. Well, if that's the case, you may very want to include um, specific features that are appropriate to that setup. So maybe you want accelerator keys, you know, where you press Alt and a key and it jumps you to a particular field on the form um, or opens a particular screen so it's quicker and easier to use. Uh, perhaps it would be nice to have the facility for double click and right click and drag and drop. Well, because those things or uh, printing is another big one, sorry. Um, you know, if you're working on a Windows machine, then you may very well want to be printing to your local network printers. Uh, so the limitation is that it's all working to the lowest common denominator. So because the other platforms and perhaps other form factors um, are not appropriate for some of those features, right click, double click, accelerator keys and so on, they're not available. So you can't put those in. So you've got a limitation there. So you should think about what devices people are using uh, and how they're using them and whether you want to have any of those platform specific features on them. Okay, so I said two limitations. Let's see if we can give ourselves some space here. So another limitation then is going to be performance. So when you're running your Power App, it's either going to be running through the Power Apps player from the uh, Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. So it's either going to be on the Power Apps player or you're going to be going through a web browser. So if you like, you've got your Power App that you have created. And then it's going to be going through one of these things to actually run on your machine or on your device. And the issue here is simply that when you're running through, you know, some sort of emulator, it's probably not the right term to use, uh, but you're working through um, a compatibility layer, an abstraction layer, then your app is going to be performing slower than if it were able to run directly against the machine. So when you're using Power Apps, you are giving up performance when compared to a native app. Now that may not be particularly important to you. Uh, it depends on the situation and the circumstance, but, but sometimes it is. So for example, I've been um, working on uh, an app and it's going to be rolled out to many people who already have devices issued to them by their organization. And those devices are pretty low spec, cheap devices. And so the organization is gonna be upgrading the devices. Now, I don't know quite where the, the break point um, sits in terms of where acceptable performance would be for this particular app, but it is possible that had we developed a native app, then that organization may not have needed to upgrade those devices. So there's always gonna be a, a break even point. So it may not have been relevant in the specific case I'm thinking about, but there are times where it is going to be. So if you've got an app where performance is key, perhaps it's something that's you know used in front of a customer, then uh, have a think about what hardware you're gonna be running it on and whether it's actually gonna be quick enough. Okay, so if we go back to our little list then of times when we should and shouldn't be using Power Apps, we can probably add to this a couple of things here. So when not to use Power Apps, so don't use them if external sharing is important. Don't use them if performance is key. 
and don't use them if you need platform specific features there we go right let's see if i can move this stuff around a little bit so it's not all overlapping there we go so on to the next thing that i want to have a look at so let's give ourselves a little bit of space sorry so as we know power apps is what they term a low code solution with a low code solution you can get an app up and running pretty quickly okay as long as it's a relatively simple app um, you're getting rid of a lot of the overhead uh, that you might otherwise need with uh, with a full code platform so low code can be really useful for getting an app up and running fast if it's not too complicated low code has its limitations though so i would argue that once you reach a certain level of complexity with your apps it becomes quite difficult to build them in a low code solution and you also have issues around maintainability and extensibility so something i will say here is that in power apps um, as the, uh, let me rephrase that um, in any system you can write bad code in power apps it is hard to write good code so what do i mean by good code well as your apps get bigger um, a standard practice in coding is to start breaking things into chunks reusable chunks so perhaps you've got something um, which needs to go ahead and write some rows to a table so in traditional code you might set up a function which is its own little black box if you like which accepts some parameters in and it does what it needs to do and goes ahead and writes those records perhaps there's a bit of validation going on inside here as well that will not write those records out if certain criteria are not met so in traditional code you would set up something like that and then you would keep calling that from different parts of your app power apps doesn't really work that way there there are ways where you can try to encapsulate um, some code but they're fudges and their workarounds again and again my argument here is what should we be doing if we have to start doing fudges and workarounds then perhaps power apps isn't the tool that we should be using because the the model in power apps if we had to be in many places writing to this same table or entity we would tend to have lots of repeated bits of code lots of very similar code repeated throughout our app and then let's say that we need to modify uh, our logic for our validation or there's an extra field in there that we need to write to or we just need to do something different if we've written our app so that this code is repeated in multiple places we've got to find all those places where that code is repeated and if you're working on somebody else's code that can become a real nightmare because it's very difficult to search through the code in power apps to find out where things are being referenced and it may be that the there's a, a button somewhere um, on a screen that writes to this table and you need to make that update to bring in this new bit of functionality there as well but you're not so familiar with the app so you're not even aware that that button exists and most of the time that button is invisible so when you're in the designer you can't even see it you've got to know that you've got to go through certain paths through the app to that button to be visible and then you see that button and then you think oh yeah maybe that button is writing to that uh, particular table as well so that's another place where i've got to to fix this thing so i would say that power apps it can be quite difficult to write Good code you've got to be very disciplined and you've got to use various workarounds to try to make sure that you reuse as much code as possible uh, and not be reinventing the wheel and have repeating code all over the place <laughs>
Alright. So there are limitations to your low code and I would also argue that um, as well as it being difficult to maintain, once you reach a certain level of complexi complexity with Power Apps, it becomes quite difficult to build. Um, it's, it's a little bit like a, a whole load of tower of cards. There we go. Um, because everything is kind of interrelated and everything is interlinked. So if you go ahead and you take out part of that tower, you're in danger of the rest of it falling down. Or perhaps a better example is, is um, Jenga. You know, you don't know which blocks you can pull out and mess around with and which ones you can't before the app begins to collapse on you. So low code has its limitations. So if I were to try to um, sort of put this on a chart, let's give this a go. Uh, so let's say we've got the difficulty over here and we've got the complexity here. Power App starts off nice and strong. If it's not too complex, it's going to be very easy for you to start to put that together. Uh, but as you go along and things get more and more complex, eventually you reach a point where it sort of goes boom, exponential. Yeah, where you've got so many screens and so many interrelated things that any change that you make within your code is starting to really complicate and confuse matters. Now, I guess if we were to try to compare that with a, a more traditional solution, uh, you might say, OK, look, we start off quite difficult. There we go, because we've got these environments to set up and, you know, we've got to, to learn how to even get a project started. It's not just to dive straight in and, and get going. So you start off quite difficult. And as the complexity goes up, well, it, it is going to become more difficult for you to do your work. But eventually you're going to hit a crossover point where had you developed in a more traditional code solution, some sort of native app versus your power app, then the difficulty becomes much less than the equivalent app made in the power app platform. And we should probably also keep in mind things like um, testing. So if you have nicely compartmentalized the things in your uh, native app, then if you change a particular screen, then likely it's only going to be that screen that you really need to give thorough testing to. Whereas in Power Apps, because anything on any screen can interrelate with anything on any other screen, um, then your testing has to be much more thorough every time you make even a small change in the Power App because of the possible knock-on consequences. So there's definitely a limit to the complexity of the app that you want to be producing in Power Apps. So let's uh, see if we can add that to our little list here. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to uh, shuffle this around again. So we should not be using Power Apps if our apps are complex. And I'll say or need regular maintenance hash extension. Okay, if it's something that you're going to be keeping building on top of, building on top of, building on top of, then you are probably going to reach this inflection point where a native app or a, or a full code app Xamarin, whatever, I'm not going to go into the specific um, alternatives, uh, but where alternatives start to make a lot more sense than a power app. Okay, so let's have a look at the next thing then. So the next thing is, um, let's say, the environment. Uh, 
So a nice thing about Power Apps is that the environment is created for you. You don't have to worry about it. You're not setting up web servers or anything like that. It's all there. Uh, you're not having to do patching on servers. You're not having to do maintenance. So Microsoft is taking care of all of that for you. And that is great until or unless perhaps something goes wrong. So all the time, um, Microsoft are improving things. They're putting in upgrades. Um, you know, they're putting in new features. And as I say, that's great. You don't have to lift a finger. They just appear. The problem is sometimes they may break things. So maybe I'm just unlucky, but I've had two occasions where an update has been applied over the weekend by Microsoft. And I've come into work on the Monday morning and I've got a whole load of customers screaming at me, why is my Power App stopped working? So I've had two occasions and I'll, I'll run through the details quickly, but I've had two occasions where production apps have been broken by updates that were applied um, over which we have no control and over which we, we cannot reverse. So the first of these issues was um, related to explicit column selection. So there is an option in Power Apps called explicit columns, excuse me, explicit column selection. And what that does is it says, right, okay, anytime you are grabbing data from uh, your data sources, that tends to be a slow operation and it's slowed down by two things, the number of rows that we're having to, to pull back. Um, and if you want to know how to reduce that, then you need to look into something called delegation. Uh, I've got a recent video where I go into some depth on delegation. Um, but the other thing is the number of columns that you are bringing back as well. So what explicit column selection does, it's, it's an option in the advanced settings in Power Apps, where if you turn it on, then it says, hey, you don't appear to be using this column. So when we go and get the data, we're not gonna bother bringing that column back. So that's gonna speed up your, your data calls. Unfortunately, um, Microsoft decided to change the way that the explicit column selection uh, chooses which columns it's going to bring in. And so columns that it was previously bringing in, uh, bringing in that it was going and getting, it, it, it was confused about whether it needed it or not, and it was no longer picking up that column and it was required. So this is an app, or it was actually several apps, which had not been touched for many weeks or months, and all of a sudden they broke because over the weekend an update was applied and that update changed existing behavior. And unfortunately, it was behavior that we were reliant upon in our apps for them to function correctly. So that was one uh, time when our apps broke. Uh, another time, more recently, uh, it may be more related to CDS than to Power Apps itself, but we had a situation where we had an app which interacted with a particular entity. I seem to recall it was the appointment entity, uh, and it was bringing information in from there and uh, on occasion writing information to there as well. And all of a sudden, we started getting error messages uh, saying that certain columns couldn't be found. Now, of course, once bitten twice shy, I had not turned on explicit column selection because that had bitten me before. So I didn't have explicit column selection turned on. And I think what had happened behind the scenes is in this appointment entity uh, and CDS entities have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of columns. Um, I'm not a fan of CDS. Uh, maybe I'll do a video on that sometime. Uh, but I think what had happened is that some of these columns had been retired so some of the columns had been removed that nobody ever uses and the connector had not been updated to be aware that those columns had been removed. So every time we were using the connector to say, give us the columns from the app, we were getting 
error messages back saying, well, I can't find these columns. So paradoxically enough, the solution to that, to get us up and running again quickly, was to, split, was to switch explicit column selection back on. We then had to do some work because the explicit column selection doesn't always bring back all the columns you need. So you have to do some work to, to be very clear about, you know, you do want these columns after all. Uh, but that meant that it was ignoring these old columns that were not correct and we could carry on working. But in the first case, we probably lost um, about a day while we were figuring out what the problem was, um, figuring out what a potential solution was, and then testing that and then rolling that out to users. And then this one took us a bit longer. So that was probably two or three days that we were out of action for while we tried to work out what was going on and get a solution in place. We did contact uh, Microsoft and raise tickets for both of these, but by the time Microsoft had a solution in place, we'd already got a workaround in place. So, you know, we were, we were on our way. Uh, okay, one other little horror story then. Um, it didn't affect a production app, but an app that was about to go into production. So we had an app that was ready to go into production uh, and there was a change to something called the app checker. So the app checker runs every time you open uh, your power app in studio mode or whenever you're working on your app the app checker is is working in the background and the app checker is is cool all the time it's saying uh, okay you've got a formula over here that refers to um let's say this text box so does this text box exist and then if you accidentally delete that text box out the app checker will say hey you've got a little error um this is this is the problem so another thing the app checker does is it says, OK, for all of your data sources that you're pointing to, um, can I see that data source? Can I see that field in that data source? So that's really useful unless the app checker goes wrong and does what it does in this case where it got itself stuck in a loop. So it was just continuously checking. OK, you couldn't interrupt it. You couldn't stop it. As soon as you fired up Studio, the app checker was checking. What we wanted to do was we wanted to deploy an app which was using the Dynamics connector. And when you're using the Dynamics connector, as you move from environment to environment, so from UAT to production in this case, you've got to change the data source. You've got to say, hey, point to the prod data source. Don't point to the UAT data source. But because this app checker was continuously running, it was locking the data sources in the app and not letting us remove them. So we lost about four or five days there. We missed our, our intended production rollout um, by several days because right at the critical moment, we had this problem. And again, we raised the ticket with Microsoft um, and Microsoft resolved the problem after a few days. Uh, but just keep in mind that you are reliant uh, on an external party to make sure that everything is right for your apps to run. So if Microsoft release some sort of update upgrade and it has a negative performance on your apps, you can't necessarily expect a super fast response to that because Microsoft have a vast number of customers and it might be that you are part of a very small number of customers experiencing a problem. So it's unlikely that the thing is going to be rolled back and, you know, as with everything in life, people need to prioritise things and your issue may not be the priority. So let's come up here to our when not to use Power Apps. And let's add another little item to this list. OK. So you don't want to use Power Apps when you need control over your environment. So you can roll things back if there's a problem. So either if you need control over your environment or if um, your uptime is absolutely critical. OK, for some apps, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world if uh, if the app is is broken for a few days. People can go back to a paper process or they can put off the thing that they're doing. 
But if uptime is important, if your app is really critical to the functioning of your business, then you should think carefully before you choose Power Apps as the platform that you put it on. There can be problems and outages with any environment with any provider, but you just have to think about who do you want to be in charge? Do you want to be able to, um, you know, call in extra resources, pull people off their weekend break and say, hey, come and fix this because you're using your own um, environment and your own architecture? Uh, or, or are you OK to be reliant on a third party? So control over uptime is, is an issue there. OK, so let's go a little bit further. And now we're going to talk less about technical and uh, about licensing. So licensing can be quite complicated in the world of Power Apps. So with Power Apps, you, you typically get uh, what they call a seeded uh, Power Apps license with your Office 365 subscription. So each of your Office 365 users should be able to make use of, of Power Apps. And obviously Power Apps can connect to all sorts of different things. And some of these things are deemed to be included. So uh, let's think about data sources. So if you want to be using Excel, that's fine. That's included. So that's Excel on, on one drive. Um, you should never use it. It's not production uh, sensible thing to do, but uh, it's on the free side. Also, SharePoint lists are on the free side as well. Uh, I shall just point out here, SharePoint is not a database and should not be used as such. Eventually, it will bite you. Um, so bitter experience coming out there. Uh, but you can use SharePoint for free. Um, but if you want to use uh, the likes of CDS, then you're going to have to have additional licensing. Uh, your Dynamics licensing might cover that. Or if you want to use SQL, which is, in my view, by far and away, the best data source that you can use. SQL is just awesome in every possible way. Uh, if you want to use SQL as well, you're going to have to pay for that premium license. And that premium license is based on uh, the number of users of the specific apps that you create. So let's say you've got 100 users in your organization and you create two apps which you want to make use of this SQL connector. OK, well, the pricing for that now is $10 US per month per user, per app, okay? So if you look at that, so for a given month, I've got 100 users, I've got two apps, 10 bucks for each. So quick bit of maths there, and that app is now gonna cost us $2,000 a month to run. So I've said um, in my little diagram, uh, if I've still got it up here, you know, look, Power Apps is really good for getting you started quickly. Um, so it's got a big advantage over other uh, development methods up to a certain point and certainly at the beginning. But if, if we change this uh, from difficulty to the cost, okay, you're going to end up with a similar sort of graph. So as the complexity goes up, you're going to start needing premium connectors to do things properly, and your cost is going to go zoom. It would have been better if I'd done that in green, but your cost is going to go boom that way. Whereas with your, let's say, native app, something which you're not having to pay these subscription costs for, then you know, things are going to be a lot flatter over time. OK, so. Back down here to the licensing. There we go. Now, um, another little tale of woe from experience then on the licensing. 
when Power Apps was first released, um, SQL was on the free side of the uh, connector, paywall, if you like. So you've got this concept of premium connectors and standard connectors. So originally SQL was a standard connector and that covered uh, both um, on-prem SQL. Sorry, my pen's not working for some reason. There we go. So that covered on-prem SQL through a gateway, as it was called, and it also covered you for the Azure SQL. And then, if I remember rightly, it was sort of early 2019, Microsoft said, actually, we're going to move this um, on-prem gateway over onto the premium side. So people then had a choice. They could say, well, OK, I'm, am I going to pay my 10 bucks per month per user per app? Or are we going to move over to Azure SQL? And people thought, well, OK, look, we can see everything sort of going towards the cloud these days. Um, and Azure SQL is, is, you know, not bad value for money. So a whole bunch of people said, OK, all right, we'll do that work. We'll move ourselves onto Azure SQL so that we don't have to pay these premium license fees. And then I think it was about seven, eight months later, Microsoft announced they were going to charge for the Azure SQL as well. So the folks who were hit by that, I think, were quite legitimately upset. So let's summarize a few things um, related to licensing then. You've got to have a think about how long your app is going to be in use for and whether it's ever going to get caught by the licensing. So it might be that you already know that you really want to use as your SQL. Let us say you've got an app and you know that you need a proper, well-performing data source with, you know, proper security and stored procedures and proper relational views and everything else. So you, you're thinking, right, I want to build an app on SQL. If you want to do it in Power Apps, then I would argue to justify the licensing, you need a high value app, an app which is going to produce a lot of value for your business with a low number of users. So if that's your scenario, then yeah, all well and good. But always think about what might happen in the future as well. So it may be that at the moment, um, it, this is a low number of users because everybody's emailing requests into some admins. Okay, and the admins put that into the app and off you go. And then someone says, hey, let's change the business process. Uh, so that people don't have to go through these admins, so that people are just putting the stuff directly into the app themselves. So then you might have a situation where you're going from, you know, let's say five users um, of the of the app collating the information for other people, and suddenly you're going to ramp up to all the people in your organisation doing it for themselves directly, 500 users. So that makes a massive difference in terms of the licensing. So. The premium licensing to me makes sense if you are sure you are always going to have a relatively low number of users and a relatively high value uh, process. Okay. So I guess related to both um, licensing and the fact uh, that you're doing everything on sort of Microsoft servers and you you can't move it if you want to. So sort of something from both of these points, putting it together, is you've got to trust that the Power Apps platform is going to be around for as long as you're expecting your app to last. It's not impossible. I'm not saying it's likely or that it's going to happen, but I'm saying it's not impossible that perhaps Microsoft decide to abandon Power Apps for some other technology. 
Um, likely, probably not, but then again, let's have a little think about some other high profile things that Microsoft have abandoned after everyone thought that they would uh, likely stick the course. So there's things like Windows Phone, the Microsoft Band, uh, Groove, uh, and the Groove Music Pass, uh, Windows Home Server, Windows Media Center. These are all things that have been abandoned over time. And so if Microsoft decides to abandon Power Apps, where does that leave you? There's no way you can take your Power App and just run it on another platform. Okay, if you don't like the way, for example, Microsoft run as your SQL, you could quite easily spin up a VM in some other provider's uh, cloud environment and install SQL Server on there and you could carry on working. But you've got no way of doing something similar for Power Apps. You you can't get the, the Power Apps sort of runtime or whatever um, so that you could carry on running it, um, you know, uh, away from away from Microsoft. So, OK, these examples I've given here are all um, pretty much sort of consumer level things. But if you have not heard of Access uh, web databases or access web apps. Okay, these were precursors in a way to Power Apps. And these were technologies that were abandoned by Microsoft and people were given a fairly limited amount of time. I think it was about 18 months notice. People were told, look, we don't think this platform is the way future anymore. Sorry, is the is the future anymore. So we're going to turn it off. So you've got 18 months to migrate whatever critical apps you've got running on this to some other platform. So it could happen and it has happened in the past. So let's just whiz back up to our list again of the times when I think Power Apps may not be the right solution. And we'll summarize here. So we were saying, okay, if you want control over your uptime and control over your environment, then perhaps Power Apps is not for you. Uh, we also need to add that then to say, um, if you need premium connectors and you have a large number of users, then I don't think Power Apps makes a lot of sense uh, because for the licensing costs that you're going to be paying over the lifetime of the app, you could just pay the money up front and develop a native app, which is not going to have those subscription costs. And, you know, if your app is critical to your business and you foresee using it for the long term, then perhaps Power Apps is not the platform for you just in case uh, there's a change in the licensing, which changes the cost benefit analysis, uh, or because a few years down the line, there's a, a change of direction again, um, and Power Apps is no longer flavor of the month and some other technology comes along instead. Okay, so that is my set of when not to use Power Apps um, ideas. I appreciate some may not agree with, with all of that, but uh, do feel free to post in the comments um, what you think of this. In terms of when you should use Power Apps, then really what that leaves us with, I think, is you can use Power Apps, you know, Power Apps is great for, let's say, quick and dirty. So quick and dirty, quick wins. So processes in your business which are currently 
a little bit slow, they involve too much email going backwards and forwards or too much paperwork or going through a few administrators. So if you've got something which is quick and dirty, it's not super critical, it's not the end of the world if it goes down, it's not the end of the world if you need to switch it off or move to a different technology, um, then that is great. So quick and dirty stuff um, is, is really good. Um, you've also got, as I say, the high value low users type apps as long as they are not too complex so we have to say these are relatively simple or simple to moderate in terms of their complexity because remember as we get more complex with the apps they get more and more difficult to maintain and every time you want to make a change you've got to go through all of that uh, regression testing all over again because we can't isolate our changes to just little sections of the app. Yeah, so quick and dirty, high value, low users, relatively simple or moderately complex type things. Um, I also see Power Apps probably having quite a good future uh, over the top of um, CDS dynamics pains me to say because I don't really like working with CDS very much as I say maybe I'll do a, a video on um, on my issues with CDS and hope that someone can convince me that I'm just not seeing the light that others are seeing but my personal view I'm not a fan of it as it stands at the moment um, but if you're paying for dynamics anyway uh, my understanding of the licensing for that means that you can use power apps so you can use Power Apps to extend your um, Dynamics applications. And if you've gone all in on Dynamics, um, you know, then, then you're all in, <laughs> as it were. So you're not taking any greater risk, I think, than you've already taken by going with Dynamics by having Power Apps on top of it. Yeah, Dynamics is a long-standing product, so I'm sure there's always going to be something that you can use for customizing it. Um, you know, even in the unlikely case that uh, that that Power Apps is replaced by by something else, um, my suspicion would be that there would always be a Power Apps equivalent for Dynamics, so that people can continue to run their customizations on top of their Dynamics ERP solutions. Okay, so that's been quite a long one and a lot of talking, but hopefully that gives you something to have a think about. And uh, as I say, you know, these are my opinions uh, based on my experience, but they're still my opinions. So if you don't agree, that's fine. Um, but if you want to, uh, you know, take issue with anything I've said in, in the comments, please do. If you want to make your own video response, if you're incensed by anything that I have said here, then uh, please go ahead and I'll be more than happy to uh, put a link in the description to your responses. Okay, so thanks very much and happy power apping.